Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 290, Is the Socinian Interpretation of John 1 Correct? A Conversation with Carlos. After exploring Socinian-type interpretations of the prologue to John for three episodes, in this episode I discuss with Carlos from Restoration Fellowship why I don't think these interpretations are correct. So first, Dale, I'd like to ask you, what do you mean by the Socinian John 1 interpretation? It's basically an interpretation of the prologue to John where it's all about the man Jesus. And then there isn't any reference to this eternal or at least pre-existent divine person called the Word. We call it the Socinian view because those are the earliest known people offering this interpretation, I think. People in the mid to late 16th century. And so they say the beginning mentioned means like the beginning of the gospel era, you know, the era in which Jesus was with his disciples. It's all about Jesus from start to finish, and it doesn't really go through time from earlier to later. It's not a view I had ever heard of, you know, before I really got deep into this subject. But then at some point, maybe it was when I read the Rakovian Catechism, I learned that, yeah, this was a view that Unitarian Christian scholars had taken very seriously and come up with lots of arguments to try to establish this. And recently on my podcast, I had Dr. Andrew Perry on for an interview, and he's written several papers and book chapters. I mean, on the face of it, it's a very attractive reading. Before we get to it, let me just read first. So this is what's known as the prologue to the Gospel of John. So we have, in the New Testament, we have the Gospel of John, and then we believe he wrote the letters, the first John, second John, and the third letter of John. And we also believe that he wrote the book of Revelation, also known as the book of the Apocalypse. Let me just read through this. It starts like this. In the beginning, so this is the NIBRE, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be what came to be. Through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So traditionally, Dale, can you tell us how this has been understood for the last two millennia of, of the movement? Yeah, since the arrival of Logos theories in the middle of the 100s, where God has to create indirectly through his word, people have just found this type of reading irresistible. So what they would have said back in the 100s was, uh, in the beginning was this word and it was with God, and the word was, they would say, a God. And then God makes all things through this word. And eventually, in verse 14, the word becomes flesh. And so they understand that to be this eternal or at least pre existent divine person who either gets a human body or what they later came to call the complete human nature, which consists of a body and a rational soul. So it's the same person, the same self becoming human at a certain point in time. That's how they're looking at the whole thing. So in short, this is their favorite text about incarnation theory. In Greek, the word here translated the word is the Greek logos, which simply, if you look at a lexicon, I believe it just simply means speech. It means a word, it means speech. Word, um, account, account, rhetoric, message. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, does it ever mean a person, an actual individual? No, although uh, one time in the book Revelation, Jesus has the title, the Word of God. But other than that, no, the Word is never a person. Okay, so let me ask you then, why most translations today, as you know, most have the pronouns there, he and him. So, you know, if I'm reading this as a layperson, 
and they capitalize the word by the way mm -hmm. so immediately i'm i'm thinking a person and then obviously the clincher is the following verses which are translated he and him and so on so it's obviously leading me this translation to believe this word the logos in greek is a person so you're saying that's not what you believe that's not what i believe although i think there's no problem with translating it that way because the interpretation that i ultimately arrive at is that this is kind of a takeoff of god's wisdom as discussed in proverbs chapter 8 and so i think it's personifying the word the reason that grammatically you can put those male personal pronouns there is because halagos is a masculine term in greek but if it's personification, you'll use personal pronouns, just like when you're talking about wisdom and you refer to her and she, right? Like she's some kind of lady, this goddess type figure almost that's with God at creation. But yeah, your father-in-law, Sir Anthony Buzzard, has made the good point that there's nothing about the grammar that demands the translation use personal pronouns. You could perfectly well translate it saying it. And early English translations, in fact, did that. And you could say it's less misleading. So this is Bible Hub. I guess we have to get into the weeds a little bit here. So there you see the logos. So that's the Greek for the word. And then what we're talking about in terms of the he and him is what happens is that in, from verse 2, you have this Greek word. If you'd like to talk about that, uh, del utos. And then I believe you have the word of two. Uh, now I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation. I think you're using the Erasmian, so people don't get confused here. So tell us about those words there. So they can mean you're saying he, and they can also mean it. Is that? You can go through this passage, and uh, some of the pronouns are hutas, you know, this or this one. And some of them are just the result of a third person singular verb. And then when you translate in English, you feel like you need to supply a pronoun. So some of the pronouns correspond to something in the Greek and other pronouns are just inserted for the purpose of English style. Right. When you realize that, you realize that the Greek is not really shoving you hard towards thinking this is a person which is the impression that you might get when you see that English translation with, you know, all these extra personal pronouns. So it's not wrong. Grammatically speaking, it can be he or it. Right. But I guess you grew up uh, Trinitarian. Is that correct? Mm hmm. OK, so you grew up believing that this was the second person of a three in one God. This is the big, as far as I know, quote, proof text, proof passage of the whole trinity construct is that right yeah i think it's people's favorite you know i mean when i was trying to make up my mind about these things and try to decide what i really think the new testament view is this was a difficult passage and i wasn't sure what to make of it and in a sense i pressed the pause button and then i inquired what's the whole new testament picture about jesus and what i discovered is that he's explicitly called a man the main point the authors are constantly making is that he's God's Christ, God's Messiah. The texts that were pointed at, other than this, to prove that he existed before his conception, turn out to be surprisingly weak, whereas that's assumed just to be a slam dunk that he pre-existed. I think it's, it's actually not compelling. There are strong reasons to think that he didn't. And so, I mean, there was a while where I wasn't sure if I believed in pre-existence or not. And so I said, well, okay, maybe this is about a pre-existent divine person and then he becomes human somehow. Maybe that's possible. So I was open to that. All right. So that's the traditional understanding. Uh, so that has been the, continues to be the predominant Christian understanding throughout Catholicism, Protestantism, and many of our fellow Unitarian friends, right? So people who believe that God is one person, but there are many of those who still hold to what's known as pre-existence, and this is one of their go-tos. Yeah, and I think back when I was a Trinitarian, 
I would have said, aha, this shows that Jesus eternally or timelessly existed. So I, I was assuming that the word here was a title of Jesus. And it says, ah, in the beginning, okay, so that means he always existed. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means he already existed at the time that's being referred to. And so if that's the Genesis creation, then it's saying that this word slash Jesus had to have already existed at that time. Now, this is compatible with his having been brought into existence for the purpose of creating. And that's what all the early Logos theorists supposed. They thought that God uh, in eternity has his word as like uh, his own reason, his mind. And then when it was time to create, he spoke it out. And so at that point, that's when there comes to exist what they called the second God or another God. This is the direct agent of creation where God's standing one step farther back. Um, so yeah, it doesn't show eternal existence. At the very most, it shows existence before the time of creation. But I didn't realize that at the time. And the Socinian reading, I mean, I just literally had never heard of that. People Before we get mention. to the to the Socinian, yeah. let's stick with the traditional view because it's a difficult mm -hmm. concept. Many of our viewers. Yeah. Do you want me to express just in a nutshell the traditional view of this? Yes. The Trinitarian view is basically they say obviously the word is Jesus, so they they don't question that, and then they say Jesus was God. They think that means that he has the divine essence, like the Nicene Creed says. And he eternally existed, so again, he must be God. But he's with God, and that's person-to-person -person language, so it's distinguishing Jesus from God. But even though there are two different persons here, they're both the same God, so you have multiple persons in one God. Now, that's not how the Logos theorists looked at it in the 100s and 200s, because they didn't have a concept of a multipersonal God. So, uh, they distinguish between the one true God, God with a capital G, and then lesser deities, small g gods. And they thought this was talking about basically the earliest and greatest small g God that was with God. So, they didn't say when it says the word was God that it's attributing the divine essence to Jesus. They assumed that was not possible because only one being can have the divine essence just by definition. For if this is monotheism we're talking about. So, you know, basically they thought it said the word was a God, which is grammatically possible because it doesn't have the the in the Greek. So as a Trinitarian, Dale, the way you read this, was it in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with the Father? Mm -hmm. And this is always my question with this type of reading. How, how did you translate in your mind or in your understanding Clause C. Uh, so you got clause A, B, C, let's go. Well, they think it's uh, saying that there are two different persons here, but those two persons are one and the same God. And so, yeah, I thought Jesus was God. Which God? The one God. So Jesus and the Father are supposed to be the same God somehow. That doesn't make any sense, by the way, right? Because how can you have one God being dead and alive at the same time? So then you switch to thinking about, oh, maybe the persons are parts of God or there are different aspects of God or something. You're off to the races just kind of speculating how this could possibly make sense. Mm -hmm. But the Logos theorists thought that there were two gods being talked of here, the one true God and then this lesser second God. The modalistic monarchians who rejected Logos theory, they thought, no, this is the same God that's being referred to. And the word is something maybe like an aspect or a mode of God or something or a personality of God. So what Trinitarian tradition eventually did was they took that old Monarchian idea that there's only one God being referred to here, but now somehow there can be multiple beings or persons within that one God, which again, Honestly, it doesn't make sense, but that's the theory, and it doesn't have to make sense because it's the king. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Carlos and I explain the Socinian interpretation of John 1, and I give a couple of objections to it. Mm -hmm. 
Augustinianism, I guess it, it was a movement that developed in the 16th century Europe. But first, let's go back to the progenitors, the founders, let's call them, of Socinianism. So as far as I understand, there was an uncle called Lelio or Lelius, the Latin form, Socini, and there was his nephew, Faustus or Fausto. What can you tell us about these two guys? Because these guys are seminal. Well, I mean, they're just two of many Catholic people in this era who got the idea from Luther that maybe Christian tradition has developed in some wrong directions. Maybe we should get back to the Bible and see if we can make some corrections. So this was just happening over and over all across Europe after Luther kind of got the ball started. Faustus was involved in this group that came to be known as the Minor Reform Church in Poland. They were a flourishing kind of Anabaptist denomination. They were centered in what at the time was called Rakow, Poland, later Krakow. And they had, you know, scholars and publishing and Christian education. And eventually they were smashed and scattered to the four winds by a Catholic king of Poland after several decades. I can't remember exactly what the date of that was, first half of the 1600s. So they ended up fleeing to places like England and Holland and, well, wherever they could go. Wow. And now these guys were persecuted, as far as I know, from both sides, from the Catholics yeah. and the Protestants, uh, especially the rabid Calvinists <laughs> who were yeah. involved in a lot of murders. So they're caught at like in no man's land, right? Yeah. The first wave of the reformers, you know, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, they just couldn't give up the idea that there has to be a union of church and state, and that it's lawless and, and anti-government to want to practice Christianity without state involvement and approval, basically. And uh, they were shockingly harsh on the Anabaptists. They burned them and drowned them and imprisoned them just as enthusiastically as the Roman Catholics did. The whole idea of religious freedom in the modern world, you know, really was kind of pioneered by these more Anabaptist types, what scholars call the Radical Reformation as opposed to the Magisterial Reformation. And this guy's, as, as far as I know, influence the toleration policies of the states. Like, I believe uh, Hungary or Poland was one of the first to adopt, in Europe anyway, as far as I know, a toleration policy. In other words, you know, right? let's just stop killing each other. And I mm -hmm. think it also influenced the colonists who came here. A lot of the founders, American founders, were leaning towards those views. Is that correct? The famous Christian philosopher John Locke was a factor there. He uh, had read a lot of Socinian books, and we can now read his private journals that he left after he died, and we know that he thought the one true God was the Father. He theorized about how you know, it made sense that the state should leave this up to the conscience of individuals to understand these things as, as they see fit. I'm not sure he went as far as uh, allowing toleration of Roman Catholics, but anyway, different kinds of Protestants. And uh, it kind of got broader as it went along. So by the time you get to the early 1700s in England, they're basically tired of imprisoning, fining, killing people based on quote, blasphemous theologies. But if you look at an earlier time, you know, they are executing Unitarian Christians here and there. So, Dale, as we enter here into the so-called Rakovian uh, or Socinian, sorry, uh, interpretation here, t tell me just quickly, what do you know about this particular document, which you can, it's free, obviously, online. So this is where we find this interpretation you're about to lay out. But first, set up the document here, because people probably haven't heard what Rokovian Catechism is. It's a really interesting and important source. It actually had some roots in work done by Faustus himself, but the first version was published in 1605. And uh, it was a group project. So at all stages of it, in its various editions, it was worked on by several different Unitarian Christian scholars. And uh, it, it has a lot of um, really helpful material in it. If you're a Unitarian Christian today, you'll disagree with some things in it, but you'll probably agree with a lot of things in it as well. 
They tended to be very disciplined arguers and have very just clear, simple reasoning that you can follow. How much did this document in particular influence your um, coming into the non-Trinitarian view? Um, that's hard to say. I don't know. I was reading so many different things. I was reading dozens of different things from the 16, 17, 1800s. This was a factor. There wasn't any one source. By the time I found this book, I already had discovered that in the New Testament, the one true God is not the Trinity, but rather the one true God is the Father. And whenever it talks about the one God, it means the Father. It only calls him the Almighty and so on. And so I think when I discovered this book, I was still deciding whether I believed in pre-existence or not. And this is one of the representatives of Unitarians who don't believe in pre-existence. So I think I was reading it to a large extent for that reason. And how much do you think it has influenced the modern non-Trinitarian movements, that document? Modern, like 20th and 21st century? Yep. So your JWs, your Christadelphians, you know. Um, I don't know that the JWs and Christadelphians were that influenced by it. I'm, I'm not maybe the right person to ask about that, though. I think they were reinventing the wheel, both of them. I know the Christadelphian founder was kind of just coming up with it on his own without using a whole bunch of other stuff. Not sure about the JWs. Right. A guy called John Thomas, I believe, mm -hmm. in the uh, Rutherford and some other Russell. Guy. Russell, Russell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's get to the, the uh, Socinian one. Uh, uh, Dale, what do you want to say about the interpretation they came up with? Well, I really think it's, it's motivated well, in a sense, and it's attractive. The main character in the New Testament is the man, Jesus. Whenever it talks about the Son of God, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, etc., it's always talking about a man. And in our view, there isn't this eternal divine person also in addition to the man. And so what they're doing is they're coming to this passage, like a lot of scholars do with Philippians 2, and they're saying, wait, can't we understand this as just all being about the man and not bring in this other person that's not a man? Because that other guy is controversial, and do we really need him? So they're trying to uh, reduce the cast, you could say. Also, on the positive side, they have some really astute observations that support their reading. One is that the phrase, all things, in Greek, tapanta, typically in the New Testament does not mean all the things that were created, or the cosmos, things like that. It typically means other collections of all things, like all the beings who are redeemed by Christ and things like that. Another good point they have is that NRK, in the beginning, often in the Bible, such as the first verse of Mark, refers to the beginning of the Christian era. Jesus, later in John somewhere, you know, says, I've been with you since the beginning. And a beginning is a, a start of a portion of time, but which portion is just relative to whatever the subject matter is. But one usage in the New Testament is the start of the Christian era, which is basically the public ministry of Jesus. They're saying, well, can't we take this that way? They're also right that, you know, there is that one passage in Revelation, Jesus is referred to as the Word of God. So they're saying, okay, well, this word that was with God and that quote was God, shouldn't we just say this is the man Jesus? Because it's the man Jesus in Revelation who is so-called. So if this worked, I would be all in favor of it. Uh, I just think that there are some problems with the interpretation, which I have a list of those that we can talk about. And also, I think there's another rival interpretation, which is more compelling, all things considered. All right, please do um, share those. The reasons that they give for saying that the Word is none other than Jesus Christ, the man, I think just are not very strong reasons. He is the author contrasting Jesus with uh, John the Baptist, but I don't think that supports their point at all. Andrew Perry tries to argue this. 
It's significant to me that the author does not call Jesus the Word of God anywhere in the rest of this book. He does call him the way, the truth, the life, the true light, the resurrection, the life, and so on. He could have very easily just thrown on, oh, and this is the very Word of God. Because, you know, God's Word is preeminently in him and comes through him, so you might as well call him the Word, which is why it happens in Revelation. But it seems to me that he's pointedly not doing that um, because he doesn't want you to think this is Jesus that existed back at the time of the Genesis creation. Um, verse 10, I don't think makes sense on their reading, and they have to come up with some strange moves to try to get around it. So, he was in the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. I mean, the world did not come to be through the man, Jesus. At this point in the prologue, you still see the he there as, as the impersonal, the, the personified word and light. Is that correct? If we're talking about my interpretation, I think that 10 through 13 are actually talking about pre-Jesus. Although I think the author is playing a game here where he's intentionally making it sound like Jesus. The way I understand it, it's talking about God's Word being available to humankind, and this is the one through which God made everything, but, you know, like the world system doesn't recognize Him. Uh, he comes to His own, that's the people of God's Word, that would be the Jews, but they continually reject Him. But, well, they didn't all reject Him. Some of them, you know, essentially cooperated with God and received God's Word. And then, finally, the Word makes its kind of definitive last entrance into the world and kind of gets all the way in and that's in the man jesus verse 14 and it's explicit right i mean it, it introduces yeah. the son in for 14 yeah. so before 14 there is no son is that what you're saying that's my view now i know a lot of people like anthony buzzard for instance think that the subject is jesus uh as of verse 10 yes Ten. Because it says he was in the world and it uses a masculine pronoun there. I think the reason it switches to a masculine pronoun is because it had just been talking about the true light, which is neuter. And I think it's going back to the word, the word of God that's now coming to his own people. I'm not convinced that you should think that the word is the man Jesus Christ here. And I don't think they've made the case they seem to think that 1 John 1 helps their case. I actually think 1 John 1 hurts their case. I don't know if you want to talk about that now. Yeah, actually, yeah, let, let's do that. So this is, the okay. again, like I said, uh, John is believed to have written a gospel, three letters, and revelation. So this is, you know, known in the geek scholarly world as the Johannine Corpus. I'll just read a couple of verses here. The Word of Life, what was from the beginning... This is the N-A-B-R-E. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we looked upon and touched with our hands concerns the word of life. For the life was made visible. We have seen it, testified to it, proclaimed to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was made visible to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim now to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. For our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So what the Socinian interpreters usually say is that they see the hearing, the touching, the seeing. Look, it's the man, Jesus, that you could see and hear and touch. But I think we have to read it very carefully because he says that we're going to tell you about the word of life, which was from the beginning. Hmm, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? So a lot of people will take this to be a kind of comment, even a correction on a misunderstanding of the passage we were talking about a minute ago, the prologue to John. They have seen, touched, and heard things, but it wasn't the word of life that they saw, touched, and heard exactly. They heard, saw, and touched things concerning, it says, the word of life. So, yes, they did experience Jesus and Jesus' ministry, and this is knowledge of the word of life. He seems to be, in this whole passage, avoiding using singular personal pronouns that are masculine. So he, he says what a couple of times, and he uses the neuter term. Then he starts talking about the life, the eternal life that was with the Father. I take it he means the same thing there as 
the word of life. He's kind of equating eternal life with the word. But life is feminine in Greek. He could have referred to the word using a masculine singular personal pronoun because, again, that word in Greek is male, but he doesn't. So it looks to me like this doesn't at all support the word being the same person as the man Jesus. In fact, it looks like he's going out of his way not to talk about the word like it's a man or a literal person. So this eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us, right, it was revealed to them through the ministry of Jesus. This word of life that was from the beginning, yeah, that's what was in Jesus. And I think that's his thought in the prologue to the gospel as well. Yeah, so there's no doubt that the word is not as personified, can we say, as in the gospel, as a person, yeah, as much as it is. I think it's not personified it at, at all, all, really. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's what the Greek seems to be doing. So in what way did they touch and see something that is, basically you're talking about a quality of God, the Father, Jehovah, by the way, or Yahweh in the Old Testament, so in what way, again, did they touch and, and see and maybe even feel something that's a quality and not quite physical? Well, what they saw and touched and heard was the things that Jesus did and said. And he did those as the one in whom the word of God dwelled. And so that's how they learn about the word of life and the eternal life that was with the Father. It's through him. If we go back to Genesis 1, right, by the word of God, all things are made, and so on. So it's once this word is manifested that they were able to say, we have seen and heard and touched and felt that very life, and this was in this man, in this man Jesus. That's how I understand it. I don't think the Socinians have made a strong case that the word here just is the man Jesus, that those are one and the same. Another big problem I have is that there are just so many things in John 1 that sound like the Genesis creation. It's going to give any reader the impression that it's talking about the Genesis creation rather than the new creation or the beginning of the gospel era or something like that. You know, the phrase in Greek, NRK, that's how Genesis 1-1 starts off in the Greek version. Wisdom is said to be with God, NRK, in Proverbs chapter 8. Just the phrase, the word of God, Psalm 33, 6, you know, it says that God created through his word. And in Genesis 1, God says, let there be, and things come into existence. So he creates by speaking, he creates by his word. The use of the verb agenito, again, is in Genesis 1, 3 in the Greek. Uh, when it says the word is with God in the beginning, Lady Wisdom is presented as being with God at the creation of the world in Proverbs 8. When it talks about all things coming through the word, verse 3, this could be new creation, right? Because sometimes Paul talks about new creation situations as uh, Jesus you know, bringing about all things. But in verse 10, it says the world came into being, or the world came through the word. That's got to be the, the Genesis creation. And tapanta, all things in Greek, can mean the things that were created, such as Ephesians 3.9. Another thing that makes me think Genesis creation here is, I think there's actually a sequence going from earlier to later, but it's not perfectly clear because there's a jump ahead in the sequence. So first it refers NRK at the time of creation. That's the first three verses. And then in verses three through five, I think it's talking about basically ancient times, BC times. And then it jumps ahead a bit, although it's still before Christ, it jumps up to John the Baptist. It says that Jesus is still coming. The true light still hasn't yet come into the world. And then I think it's still talking about ancient times in 10 through 13. And then finally, and the word was made flesh. And in Greek, chi, and it can have a sequential kind of meeting, like, and, and here's what happened next. So I think most readers look at it this way, thinking that there is a time flow from earlier to later in the passage. And if the Socinians are right, it's all just about one time, one span of time, namely the beginning of the Christian era. 
but I think this is something that fits the other interpretation better than the Socinian one. Let me um, pause you there a sec. I think one of the things you said earlier was that you had issues with, for example, in verse 10. So if this is Genesis, right, if this is echoing Genesis creation, and you said, well, it's a bit unexplainable to you how all things, if the all things are referring to creation, Genesis, how that can be said to be through a human being. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so we know that this talk of all things being through Jesus is prominent in the later apostles. So we have, uh, if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, doesn't really matter to me, but it has this language, right? So in the times past, God spoke in, in different ways to our ancestors. In these last days, he spoke to us through a son whom he made heir of all things, through whom he created the, and I believe the Greek there is Ionos, the ages. Mm -hmm. So that type of language later on, and then, you know, you have Colossians 1, and, and I would even say 1 Corinthians 8, for us there is one God the Father, but we also have one Lord Jesus, through whom are all things, that, that type of language. Mm -hmm. So what would you say about that? Well, um, I mean, I think the all things in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 are like all, all of us, like all, all the redeemed people. The Colossians passage, I think, is very clearly a new creation context, just because it's all about Jesus's current exalted status as head of the church. And the things that it says he creates are, it looks like human and angelic rulers, basically. It's not the heavens and the earth that he creates. So Colossians 1, I love, uh, it's, a, it's a great passage. I think it's solidly in the new creation camp. This Hebrews text is, is more difficult, but I think it's also about the new creation. So I think that on the whole, that's the best way to take it. People get tripped up by the quotation in, uh, what is it, verses 9 and 10? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into that. But we, that, don't, we don't want to go there tonight. That's yeah, a difficulty. That, yeah, uh, forget that one. Uh, let, but, let me go back to the Colossians one uh, a minute. I have found, I think, uh, maybe three or four, four times in John, what's known as a divine passive. So just mm -hmm. to explain to people, all things were created. Uh, some depends on your translation, by the way. Let me let me see if I can Yeah, so it switches to a passive description and the understanding is that God is the agent. Right. So the mm -hmm. coming to being, right? That's also translated as were created. Mm -hmm. in or through the, the logos. So that's what's known as a, as a divine passive because it came yeah. into being by God. And that's the sort of language Paul uses here. So I wanted to connect the two. So Paul says he, in relation to the son, as you can see there in verse 13, right, is the subject. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, for now that by is, is, should be in, and there it is. So that can be by or in, but here. In him, all things were created. So that's the divine passive. Mm -hmm. So yeah. by God, right? Well, it depends. It depends. If it's in, it's going to be by God. Uh, if it's by him, then he's going to be described as the creator. You can talk about both of them, either of them, as the, the creator of the new creation, because God's doing it through Christ. I see. So the work created by God would still be a reference to new creation, not necessarily Genesis. Yeah, I think this entire passage has to do with new creation. If you're looking at this verse, uh, Colossians 1.16, it tells you what all things he has in mind. Things visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, or powers. So these are seemingly human or angelic rulers. So it's like he's remaking the order of rulership in the universe. Right. Uh, and he's before all things, those same things, right? He's the head of the body, it goes on to say. He's the head of this hierarchy of new leadership. Mm -hmm. When the Trinity's podcast returns, I give a few more objections to the Socinian interpretation of John 1. <laughs> 
So is there any other points about the Sassinian understanding you want to tackle? One concern I have about it, and by itself, I don't think any one of these points would be enough to torpedo the Socinian interpretation, but it's when you put them all together, then I think it starts to look like the position has some baggage and can we get a better reading? So as far as we can tell, nobody read the prologue to John this way prior to the Socinians. We don't have any evidence of it. Now, it could just be that there's texts that are now lost to us where people read it this way. But if nobody interpreted John 1 this way until the 1500s, that would be a failure of communication by the author and not to mention by God. So we know the Logos theorists were reading this as being about a second God. And we know that their opponents who rejected Logos theories were reading this where there was only one God being referred to in the first three verses. And basically the dynamic monarchians thought that the word is like a divine action or something that's in Jesus, God's working through Jesus. The modalistic monarchians thought that this word was Jesus and God. So they're kind of collapsing the father and son into the same being. But as far as people saying, hey guys, this is all about new creation, the RK here is just the beginning of the gospel era, and the word is, is the son, yes, but it's just the man. Like, I don't think there are any people like this in ancient times. That's, I think, a, a hit against it. Um, again, it's not a fatal hit. It doesn't sink their battleship because there could be lost sources that we could find tomorrow where people thought this, but Another thing I don't like about it, and I think should count against it, is that if the word is supposed to be the man Jesus, and then it says, Theos ein halagos, God was the word, the subject there is still the word. The word is in the beginning, the word is with God, and the third claim is that the word was God. And what could this possibly mean? I think there's basically three options, and none of them are attractive. So you wouldn't say that the man Jesus was God himself, right? If you're a Unitarian Christian, you realize that's an obvious mistake because there are so many differences between God and the Son of God. Okay, so we can't take it as collapsing the man Jesus and God into the same being. What about the way the Logos theorists took it, where the word was a God? This is possible, but I don't think it's very likely. Why would you call a man a lesser divine being? It sounds like something you would call an angel. But again, it is, it is possible because, you know, in chapter 10, Jesus mentions that those were called gods to whom the word of God came. I think Dr. Andrew Perry reads it as neither of those. So it's not supposed to be the one true God, nor is it supposed to be a lesser God. I think he's reading it as the word was a God a so-called God, a, th a thing with that title. But that's not a common New Testament claim about Jesus. There is arguably that passage in uh, Hebrews 1, 8, and 9, where Old Testament psalm is now applied to Jesus, and there's, you know, your throne, O God, is, is forever. Then God, your God, has anointed you. But just none of these seem likely. Dr. Perry refers to the end of the book, uh, chapter 20 in John, where in his view, Jesus is called God again when Thomas says, my Lord and my God. I don't think that's right. I don't think this book is calling Jesus God here right at the start and then at the end of the book, just to make sure you didn't miss the point. I think what's happening in the Thomas incident is Thomas is recognizing Jesus as his Lord and he's recognizing that God is truly in him as has been said several times earlier in the book, right? The Father is in me. The Father in me does his works. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So now Thomas finally does see the Father working in Jesus now that he sees him risen. So I don't think that the author is making the point that Jesus is the God or a God or that he's called God. I don't think it's any of those. I think if you read it in context, it's just that this doubting Thomas realizes that God is truly working in him, working through him. So yeah, to, to say it's Jesus being called God here, I think is unlikely. And the way I take it is, in the beginning was the word, whatever this word is, it's already there at creation time. 
it's with God, like wisdom, Proverbs chapter eight. Oh, and by the way, God was the word. It's not somebody else. It's just God. Okay. But then he says he was with God in the beginning. So then he just turns right around and personifies it. But he's already told you, by the way, this is really just God. The same God mentioned before. There's just one God mentioned, I think, in those first three verses. To be honest, the whole thing backfired on him, but it wasn't his fault that Logos theories came to be so beloved by the mainstream tradition. If he could have foreseen that, I don't think he would have written it this way. Yeah, I think uh, fundamentally the mistake is to assume that the Logos, the word, is a person. I think this is where this whole deal goes. I mean, yes, grammatically speaking, you could translate the last section there, John 1, 1 C, and the word was God. You could, a God, I, I assume, the anarther is there. I think it's rendered a God at one time. I, I forgot where in the... But I think what you said about Psalm 33, verse 6, was it? But by the word of the Lord, by the breath of his mouth, Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, it's, it's another connection to the Spirit of God. So mm -hmm. word, breath, spirit, wisdom. These things, you know, I just talked to Nehemiah Gordon, a Karite Jew, and we went a little bit into the Jewish background. And, you know, the Word of God in the Old Testament is never a person, a separate person, I, I should say. Obviously, Dale's word is personal in that it's your word, but it's not a separate person from you. So when you read two persons in John 1, 1, I think that's where this whole mess comes in. And just lastly, what you said about Psalm 33, verse 6, led me to hunt down any references to the logos in the LXX in the Old Testament Greek, right? To see mm -hmm. if the logos, so the var is the Hebrew, it's, it was translated by the rabbis as logos. I looked and looked, and someone can correct me, but not once is he or him, right, utos and oftu, assigned to the logos in any LXX mm -hmm. sample. There's no sample. So this is unique to John. It's not like the Jews understood that it was a separate person from their Jehovah, their, their one God. So to me, that, that was a huge revelation that nowhere is it a he or him. Yeah, although if I had another hour and a half to present why I hold my own interpretation, I think that we have to even go beyond the Old Testament for the background here to the prologue to John. Because what happened as time went on was the later Jewish books that get excluded from the Protestant Bibles, they continue to play around with this personification of wisdom. And they have her talking, and she says that she came out of God's mouth in one text. So, okay, well then, God's wisdom is the same as God's word. If she's coming out of God's mouth, God's wisdom comes down from heaven and dwells among us, basically as the Torah. So this personification of wisdom and then proceeding to kind of associate and even identify the word with wisdom is part of what leads to this. So there are parallels that are after the Old Testament, but before the New Testament. There are parallels here, and one of them is this, I would call it non-literal incarnation in uh, verse 14. So there's nothing about the language, you know, the word was flesh or the word became flesh and dwelled among us. There's nothing about that language that demands that it's like a ghost getting a body or a spirit taking on a human nature, body and soul or something like that. And in fact, there is this background where, you know, God's word leaps down from heaven like a mighty warrior in one place or God's wisdom comes down and now it becomes this scroll that we have that we can read the Torah. So an example I've used before is uh, the famous mansion Monticello that Thomas Jefferson built. You could say uh, Jefferson had this dream of this wonderful uh, house with all this clever architecture in it. And his dream became brick and mortar and wood and shingles. Not literally. A dream can't literally become a house. But we know what it means. It's like something was in his mind and, um, you know, was expressed in this physical object. So this eternal word of God, 
which is his wisdom by which he created. And it's the light of people and people can either accept it or reject it. This thing, quote, becomes flesh. In other words, it's now expressed most preeminently in this man. It's not talking about a literal change in a thing where at an earlier time it's not physical and now it's physical. It's just, it's a new expression. Just like when Jefferson's dream becomes reality, when his dream house becomes a real house, it's not that thoughts have turned into house, but we all understand this way of talking. And honestly, it makes more sense than all the stuff about incarnation, about a divine person, quote, assuming an anhypostatic human nature. What I'm talking about is a more natural way of speaking and thinking, and I think it makes better sense to understand that here. So when it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, the word dwelling among us, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is the bringer of God's word in the gospel according to John. And I think one of the dynamic monarchians' favorite texts was probably John 14, verse 10. Well, starting a little bit earlier, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And this is the part that I want to focus on. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Right? So the words, the message Jesus brings is what he got from God. It's not just stuff he came up with, and nor is his mission and, and his actions just something he came up with. It's God working through him. And so that's what it is for God's eternal word to dwell among us. It's for Jesus to do the kind of things you see Jesus doing in his ministry, teaching the things that he's teaching, doing the kinds of things that he's doing. For the word to dwell among us in flesh, that is in the man, that is for the Father to act in these ways. That's one way to put it. God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself, like Paul says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly the Father was in the Son, I guess. Uh, so he's the perfect mm -hmm. reflection, right? The exact representation, character, uh, Hebrews calls him. He had the perfect character. He was in the morphe form of God, and so on. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Carlos asks me about a famous textual variant in this passage. Uh, years ago, I, I was struck by the fact that the early church fathers like Tertullian, uh, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, I think pretty much in general, translate or, or render the verse 13 there in the singular. Uh, you're familiar with that tradition? Barely. I don't think I'm very sympathetic to it. They think that it's talking about the uh, miraculous conception of Jesus. Right. So basically, if you see there, uh, so 12 says, those who did accept him. So now, again, those uh, who might think this is talking now about Jesus because of the of two, right? We talked about in verse 10. Grammatically, it's a change done on purpose. Mm -hmm. It looks like, grammatically speaking. So let's say that, let's say now John is introducing here the man Jesus or about to introduce the man Jesus. So those who did not, who did accept him, he gave power to become sons of God to those who believe in his name, who was born. So this is where the singular comes in, who was born, not who were born, but who was born, not by human choice, not by blood or man's decision here, but because God, Got him, or because 
he was begotten by God, basically. That's pretty much, I believe, let's see, Irenaeus, Tertullian, I, I have a whole list, Justin Martyr, even August, up to Augustine, which is, what's that, 4th, 5th uh, century? It'd be nice if it was true, because it would have John acknowledging the tradition of miraculous conception of Jesus. I mean, but the textual scholars are just all against this, as far as I understand. They just, not that's not what the Greek says. Yeah. Um, you could see why, given how focused people were on this passage, particularly the Logos theorists, you could see how they would want there to be some reference to this special... They always hypothesized, well, not always, but they typically hypothesize that there's some kind of origin Jesus has in God, but it's not creation. And so they took to calling this eternal generation eventually. And you could see why they would want it to, to be talking about that, because it doesn't mention anything about God generating the word higher up. Yeah, I think Ignatius or Irenaeus, I think, says that the text there at John 1.13 was corrupted by the followers of Valentinius. To say what it says in our critical editions? Right. So I believe it was, uh, don't quote me, Irenaeus or Ignatius. There's a famous quote of his that says that the text was being corrupted and changed from the singular who was, you know, begotten by God to who were by the uh, Valentinians, I think was the name of the early, uh, it was an early Gnostic group. Mm -hmm. How do you understand, Jesus sometimes talks about coming from God, right? So let me give you a, a verse here. In uh, This is John 16, Dale. Mm -hmm. Okay, he says, I have told you this in figures of speech. The hour is coming when, when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but I will tell you clearly about the Father. On that day you will ask in my name. I do not tell you that I will ask the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have come to believe that I came from God. So this is what I want to ask you about. And then he says, I came from the Father and have come into the world and now i'm leaving the world and going it should be not back sorry folks that's uh, let me change that quickly that's not in the greek jesus uh, jesus never said that's right yeah going, better translations don't have that right yeah. he was simply ascending or going to the father my question to you is i have i think it was george ladd the famous george ladd I, I think it was his commentary. He said that it's a Hebrew idiom coming into the world means being born and leaving the world or going out of the world means you're dead. You're going to die. It's a Hebrew idiom. I think it was George Ladd. So what do you make of those sayings by Jesus when he, it sounds like he's the meta, the, I don't know if this would be a figure of speech, maybe half figure of speech. In relation to the word becoming flesh being more in reference to his uh, birth, what do you think of that? I'm not sure that when it says the word became flesh that it is particularly talking about his birth. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. I think the dwelling among us has to do with Jesus' ministry. So... You know, you might think God's word came upon him when the Holy Spirit came upon him when he was baptized, and boom, then he's off to the races doing all these miracles and engaging in this famous career of public teaching. Right? I think it's that old obsession with incarnation theory that makes us think that that must have to do with Jesus' birth in particular. But to go back to your passage from John 16... 16, 27, and 28 specifically. So he says, I came from the Father and came into the world, which some scholars, like I believe it's Lad, who says, well, this is a Hebrew idiom, meaning, idiom, meaning uh, a way of speaking that he was born. In other words, God, because God begat him, God procreated him in the womb. Maybe it means that. Um in, in the New Testament, they talk about things coming down from heaven. You know, every good and perfect gift is coming down from the Father of lights, it says in, where is that, in James? 
Yeah, and earlier in the book, uh, Jesus asked the people if if the baptism of John is from heaven. And so, you know, being from heaven or from the Father is is really to be, uh, you know, truly doing God's work and not just a guy who's coming up with stuff and in truth is just coming on his own authority. But coming into the world, it's not clear to me if that has to do with birth or if that has to do with his being on the world stage. He's coming from the Father and entering into his public ministry. That's going out into the world. And then he's going to go out of that, get off the public stage, and literally return to the Father. Okay, so where in the prologue does John start speaking about the ministry then of Jesus? So you're saying this is sort of a combination. It's about Genesis in the first verses there. And then you're saying now we're talking about his ministry. Is that correct? I think it's verse 14. 14 Um, is the ministry. It wouldn't be the end of the world if you want to say it's a little, a few verses earlier than that. Although what makes most sense to me is Mm -hmm. part of the background also, and Daniel Boyarin, the famous Jewish uh, Bible scholar, talks about this. There was a little motif in previous writings of... God's word coming into the world and getting rejected and he he can't find a place to rest and he goes back to heaven and things like this. And so here God's word is coming into the world, uh, shine in the darkness, darkness doesn't overcome it, but the world doesn't know him. His own people don't accept him. Well, okay. A few of them did. So I see that as that portion from 12 to 13 is the theme of it is that God's word is sort of still trying to get in fully to the world, but then it finally does in verse 14. So that's partly why I want to take it that way. But I acknowledge that, you know, when it talks about uh, believing in his name and receiving him, it sounds like Jesus, you know, in verses 12 and 13. I think the author is making the previous uh, career of the word to sound like the career of Jesus. That's how I take it. It's, it's a weird passage because it's not usual in the Bible to personify God's word this way. That's why this passage is so hard. It's a very strange passage. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's poetry, right? Uh, some call it a, a poetic sort of wisdom Christology, I've heard, or Jewish wisdom uh, you know, if you read the the book of uh, Solomon, the one that's talking about his lover and so on, and it could be that he's talking about maybe uh, a nation or something like that. Anyway, uh, mm-hmm. just quickly to share with the people. So this is the quote I was trying to remember. Lad, a theology of the New Testament, the earth is frequently referred to as the dwelling place of humanity in language that is paralleled in Jewish idiom coming into the world, and then you have all those John citations, being in the world and departing out of the world. The idiom itself is familiar. Jewish terminology coming into the world means merely to be born. To be in the world is to exist. To depart from the world is to die. So that's what some scholars say and all those references there. It's plausible for that chapter 16. All righty, let's get some questions. Uh, thanks for your time, Dale. Uh, what do you say to the Logos as the plan of God? Um, I maybe wouldn't be that specific. So I said that in my interpretation, I think there was a tradition of equating God's word with God's wisdom. And it's partly because of the Greek word logos, where logos could mean thought and it could mean the word that expresses the thought. And I think that's actually why John picks uh, Logos here and not Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom. So if word is equivalent to wisdom, then wisdom is a general kind of thing, just God's mind, that which enables God to perfectly act and always perfectly rationally act or something like that. To say it's God's plan maybe makes it sound like it's some specific plan, like do this at a certain time in a certain place. So I think it's maybe better left as just God's word and with the background assumption that they're thinking about these this wisdom literature. 
Got a question here about John 20, 28. So are you saying that Thomas is really saying, my Lord? So when, when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, I mean, he's saying it to Tom, no more. No one else is standing mm -hmm. in front of Jesus, but yes. uh, sorry, in front of Thomas, but Jesus. But you're saying that he's speaking to two persons, the, the Jesus and his father, is that? He's acknowledging two persons, yeah. It says Thomas answered him, and the him is Jesus. Literally, he is talking to Jesus. Like That's what you would have seen if you were standing there. But I believe that the author's meaning here is that he's recognizing God at work in Jesus. Part of the reason I think that is I think that this book was surely written later than any of Paul's works. And Paul has this standard confession of one God and one Lord. And I think Thomas here is being presented as, you know, the first person who makes that one Lord, one God confession. We know that was a thing in early Christianity from passages like Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. But maybe more importantly, as you know, what has gone before in the book you know, you want to see God? Well, you haven't seen me, right? Because if you've seen me, you've seen God. Okay, well, here he is, quote, seeing God. Not literally, but coming to knowledge that God is truly the mover and shaker in the life of Jesus. You no longer, did you ever hold to a literal pre-existence of Jesus as the second person, yes, you did, I guess. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, Philippians so, 2, Colossians 1, John 1. Right, so you no longer see it that way. Now for you, the mm -hmm. Son of God comes into existence for the first time in, in Mary, is that correct? Yeah. That helps you with this non-traditional, let's call it, reading of the biblical Unitarian reading that it's not a person. Uh, yeah, the two things fit together, sure. This thing that was always around, or at least was around at the creation, isn't Jesus. It's this other thing. Uh, just for the audience, what, what type of things uh, helped you? Uh, because that's one of the last things to go, <laughs> I have seen from people who come from uh, a either so-called Aryan or pre-existence view. The sort of hardest thing is the that Jesus wasn't actually there. So what sort of texts or verses can you tell people here to think about or study if they're not sure? There's a bunch of different things. I don't think there's any like really super clear verse to refute it. As your father-in-law has pointed out, and other scholars before him, even like Roman Catholic scholars, the accounts of the miraculous conception seem to suggest and presuppose, if not say outright, that that Jesus came into existence at some point in that reproductive, in that abnormal, miraculous reproductive process. And in fact, this is what we think just by common sense. We think that the reason you exist is because mom and dad got together and loved each other very much. And if you want more details, go ask your dad. We think babies are brought into existence in the reproductive process, whether that's at conception or sometime after conception. And we think the, the parents are, are two agents that combine their action to produce the, this newly existing thing. And I think we should suppose that that assumption is operative in the New Testament. But another part of it, Carlos, was honestly, I really wanted to give two natures theories their due. Could it make sense to say that there's a being which is human and divine? And there are a bunch of different ways to parse that out, what that could possibly mean. And whichever way you turn, there are terrible problems. You get pessimistic enough where you realize this isn't a plausible thing to attribute to the New Testament authors. It's easy to conceive that God can appear as a man, right? God's all-powerful. And there are men in the scriptures who actually turn out just to be angels or to be God, they turn out to be theophanies. So it's easy for an all-powerful being to appear as a human. There are no objections to that. What's hard is for a God to be a man. The one person here on these two natures theories is going to have to be the Logos, and this doesn't look like a man at all. It looks like the kind of thing that would exist even if there never had been any men, never had been any human beings.
So disillusionment with two natures theories, just rather than assuming that somehow this could work out that the, well, there's the divine in Jesus and the human in Jesus. What's not to like? It's like just a neat combination. No, realizing that, no, that seems like it's actually impossible. And it seems that the divinity rules out the humanity. Um, that made me more willing to not just believe what was in the study Bible footnotes. That, oh yeah, this is pre-existence in Philippians 2. And oh yeah, God's creating the world through Jesus here in Colossians 1. But, you know, I wasn't going to give up pre-existence until I could come up with a non-arbitrary, well-motivated, plausible first century reading for every single pre-existence text. I wasn't going to just stick with something that sounded vaguely plausible. Uh, I, I wasn't going to get rid of pre-existence just because it was easier now that I have Unitarian friends. I really had to just grind through every single proof text for pre-existence and then become convinced eventually that, wait a second, it actually makes sense not to take it that way. So we talked about that a while ago, an example, Colossians 1. I think that's a good one to start with. If you're really hung up on thinking that the New Testament says that Jesus was somehow involved in the creation of the world, study that really closely. And I think it all just makes sense when understood of the new creation and of Jesus in these latter days. So that's what I recommend to people is to follow scripture the best you understand it. Once you start to realize that if you come to agree with me that divinity rules out humanity and that eternal existence rules out humanity, uh, right? I mean, look, any human is by definition a creature, right? Any human is by definition something that derives from God's act of creation. So then just by definition, if you're human, you can't have always existed. You must have come into existence. There was a time when there were no humans, seemingly. But yeah, you have to you have to go with your understanding of scripture, and that's what I did. That's why I changed. Okay, so let's uh, let's wrap it up, Dale. I'll just ask uh, one last question. So this is not a salvation issue question, by the way. But is this important for the average Christian out there? What we have been discussing the different in Socinian, specifically the Socinian versus our understanding. Uh, I would say our, as in the modern-day biblical Unitarians, Christian Unitarians. Is this um, important for people to grasp? Is this just a thing you're doing uh, as a sort of hobby right now? Or why, why are you focused on this and the importance, if any, of, of this, all this? I think it's very important because, as we mentioned before, this text is a favorite, and it's been a favorite for a long time. And it's kind of a blockbuster opening to what is the favorite gospel of a lot of people. And, you know, we need to understand what this gospel is saying and why. And Trinitarians think that this is, you know, their, their silver bullet, that uh, only an idiot would read John 1 and, and not think that there are two eternal divine persons that are the same God somehow. And that's really quite mistaken, I think, when you dig deep into the subject. And it's really the Trinitarian who has a difficult time with this passage. But just simply for the reason that educated Trinitarians think that this is their unanswerable argument, just for that reason, I think all Unitarian Christians need to have a carefully thought of reasonable answer, um, how you would interpret this by common sense and by using other scriptures. We have to keep a handle on speculation and just flights of imagination, which people love to indulge in. And I think we have to have a sober, sensible reading of this where it fits in with the rest of what's in John and the rest of what's in the New Testament. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching, by the way. Thanks for the questions. I think most would agree this is the passage. And basically, I hear you saying that it's great that Socinus and his, uh, the uncle and the nephew and the later ones, it's great that they were against the establishment, let's say, but we also have to have a cogent, you know, biblically sound counter argument. And uh, I'm hearing you say that your belief is that this is this Socinian reading is not up to par. I mean, we can make it better, maybe. I'm willing to grant that it makes more sense than the Trinitarian interpretations, but I don't think it makes as much sense as this other reading that we were discussing a bit tonight. And, you know, we have to think that John was competent here to communicate to his original audience. 
it can't be a puzzle that only scholars can figure out. It has to be something that would have made sense to them. And I just, I find the Socinian reading overall just too difficult. All right, Dale, thanks a lot for your time. This has been great. I hope this is edifying to people out there. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Dale. Thanks for having me, Carlos. Good night. This week's thinking music has been the track Organ Anomatron 14811 Mix by Spinning Merkaba. Thanks to Carlos for holding this Zoom discussion on YouTube. If you want to hear more from him, check out the Restoration Fellowship YouTube channel. I've put a link to that on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org, or you can just search for Restoration Fellowship at YouTube. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.